Hello and welcome to the webinar on what is overtourism in protected areas and what can we do about it. I'm Anna Spenceley and I chair the IUCN Tourism and Protected Areas Specialist Group. And in this webinar we're collaborating with Alan Rhodes of Ecotourism Genuino to moderate this session. This is the 10th webinar under the 2017 webinar series of the Sustainable Tourism Program of the 10-year Framework of Programs on Sustainable Consumption and Production Patterns. The webinar is being led by the IUCN Tourism and Protected Area Specialist Group, Ecotourism Genuine, and also the PUP Global Heritage Consortium. This webinar has been branded as contributing to the objectives of the 10YFP Sustainable Tourism Program and is therefore being promoted in collaboration with their coordination desk. As many of you may know, the 10YFP Sustainable Tourism Program is a collaborative platform that currently involves over 130 organizations with one common goal, decoupling tourism growth from the consumption of finite natural resources. The network offers opportunities to aggregate the efforts of members to accelerate sustainable consumption and production patterns in the tourism sector and to advance the related SDGs, known to be SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, but also sustainable development goals 8, 13, 14 and 15. And the network also offers possibilities for members to participate in public fora, discussions and debates to gain international visibility. The 10YFP Sustainable Tourism Program offers possibilities for members to exchange knowledge, such as in this webinar, to learn from other partners in the program, share experiences, lessons learned, best practices and tools. Today, on this webinar on over-tourism, we have our distinguished speakers, Professor Steve McCool and John Cole. Steve is a professor emeritus with the University of Montana and has been working over the past 40 years on the interaction of people and natural resources, particularly in relation to managing visitors in national parks and wilderness areas, and developing new ways of thinking about natural resource planning and ways of strengthening approaches to public engagement and planning processes. Steve has an extensive publication record with numerous referee journal articles and edited books, as well as he was the co-author of the popular um, second edition of the Best Practice Guidelines on Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. Steve is also the former lead of capacity building within the Tapas Group and is a board director of the PUP Global Heritage Consortium. John Cole founded and is now director of the PUP Global Heritage Consortium. After having developed the PUP process starting in Honduras in 1998 with the rare Center for Tropical Conservation. The process basically represents a holistic, adaptive and participatory way of using planning to avoid plans that end on the shelf unimplemented. PUP stands for Public Use Planning or Visitor Management Planning and John works on defining and applying emerging paradigms in heritage management in general and visitor management. In particular, he works on heritage implementation. Based in Costa Rica, John has worked with PUP around the world and writes extensively about the emerging paradigm, including a book that he has co-written with Steve McCool called The Future Has Other Plans, Planning Holistically to Conserve Nature, Natural and Cultural Heritage. So before I hand over to John and Steve, I wanted to say a few things about the Tourism and Protected Area Specialist Group. This is our vision. Um, we basically envision a future where the tourism associated with protected areas has a positive impact on biodiversity and where tourism is environmentally, socially and economically sustainable. Currently we have over 500 members worldwide within our voluntary technical network and these are people drawn from governments, protected area authorities, private sector, NGOs, donor agencies and also students. Some of the things we do include developing knowledge. For example, we've um, now developing our best practice guidelines on sustainable tourism, the third edition, which is due out later this year, um, which has 60 collaborating authors from 23 territories. Um, we've developed journal special editions, including uh, on parks, Kudo, and a recent edition of uh, the Journal of Sustainable Tourism on protected areas and tourism. And also we produce technical reports such as the recent Convention on Biological Diversity Guidelines on Tourism and Concession and Partnerships. And this is now available in English, French and Spanish on the CBD website. 
Furthermore, we work on capacity building, so such as webinars, webinars such as this one, um, and also capacity building events and field trips. And we also do networking. So um, from the 22nd of November to the 26th of November, there will be a conference on sustainable tourism in small island developing states, where we're partnering with several agencies, including the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, um, the University of Seychelles, and the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation to bring together people to discuss common, commonly um, discussed issues on sustainable tourism and protected areas and SIPs. We also take an active role in developing tourism journeys at major IUCN events, such as at the World Parks Congress and World Conservation Congress. Furthermore, we use social media such as Facebook, Facebook and Twitter um, to engage with our network and share information. This is our team, our people. Um, so we have an EXCO, which um, is a voluntary EXCO, which tries to um, guide the membership on, on activities. Um, from the 1st of December, we'll have two new Expo, EXCO members who are democratically elected by the membership. Sergei Sikoy, who will be working on membership, and Jeremy Sampson, who will be working on communications. So as you'll see, we have thematic leads, um, cross-cutting leads, and support leads, and, uh, and I help to, to chair the group. This is how you can find out more about the um, Tapas group, so various different online forums, and also our membership application is at the top. Membership is for free, so if you're keen to join, please feel free to do so. So now I'd like to hand over to Alan to moderate the meeting, and also welcome our speakers, um, John and Steve. Thank you. The park now swarms with tens of thousands of people each day, and the season lasts almost all year, instead of eight or nine months as previously. Flocks of tour buses pour in from Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Instead of coming to get a sense of nature transcendent, people wait an hour or two in traffic just to get through the park gates. And day hikers jostle with hundreds of other people on one-lane trails eroded by overuse. Trash bins can't be emptied fast enough and overflow onto the ground. Lines of vehicles to get a first-come, first-served camping spot start forming at 4.30 or 5 a.m. and many come away empty-handed. Well, what I've just read from you, read to you now, is a passage from an article in Yale E360 on over-tourism in U.S. national parks. Interestingly, after the article, there's many comments in a comment section. And there were numerous simplistic attributions of cause to why this park and many other parks is actually experiencing over tourism. I'm just going to read you one as an example. Uh, Randy Smith writes, politically correct or not, this is a fact. We were at Yosemite last week, and I'd say 75% were internationals, primarily Asians. The crowd made the experience horrible. And also in the comment section, we didn't find just explanations of why over-tourism, but people gave oversimplified solutions as well. So this is a, another person who, who writes, first, I hate to say, is to cut out foreign busloads of people. We have met many nice people from around the world, but the park should be for Americans first. There's Randy's comment. So in fact, there's a variety of factors that likely work together to influence this perception of Asian bus tourism or foreign tourism far more than the simple one explanation that people gave. I'm just going to give you a smattering of potential variables that could be working together to, to influence this perception. So how U.S. states market national parks overseas, tour operator behavior that bundles Asian tourists into large groups, National Park Service policy with respect to foreign visitors, National Park Service policy with respect to buses in general, the level of parking enforcement, parking lot and road design, existence of a perception bias that makes Asian buses more noticeable for some reason, fear by Asians to come by themselves or barriers they have to traveling in the U.S. such as language, which makes them group together. The image of the U.S. and Asia could also be an influencing factor. It might actually be that by being in groups, these bus groups are easier to manage in some cases than non-bus groups, totally opposite to the feeling in some of these comments. 
So, or maybe there's absolutely nothing measurably different at all about Asian bus tours from other bus tours. But the point is, is, is this problem of reductionist, simplistic, and unsystem thinking that's widespread throughout all of our lives, and tourism certainly is no exception to that. As Sir Thomas More wrote uh, many years ago in the famous book Utopia, by applying a remedy to one sore, you will provoke another, and that which removes the one ill symptom produces others, whereas the strengthening one part of the body weakens the rest. And indeed, we find in tourism that simple, fix, simple fixes to complex problems could work if actually the world were simple and tame, as uh, many of us were taught in school. I certainly was. And so a better way to describe the world that these ideas come from is what Steve and I call in our book the plus world, where plus is the simplest mathematical operation. So each of these letters uh, it represents a characteristic of this world where the P, for example, is predictable, that we can basically predict the systems, behaviors uh, in our world a few years into the future. But the world is linear, that there's a simple cause and a simple effect, or one effect and one solution. It makes it much easier to understand the world if we assume that it's linear. It's understandable, this is the next assumption, that with enough information, we basically can understand the dimensions of any conservation or management problem and then prescribe a solution for that. And then the world is stable, that the conditions that we are seeing today will more or less be the same conditions in the near future. In other words, the world doesn't change very quickly. The conditions don't change very quickly. You may say it's sort of like we're living in a crystal where all of the atoms line up nicely, well-behaved, predictable, ready to obey whatever we ask them to do. But then I have to ask you guys out there in the listening audience, all 113 of you, does this sound like the world we really live in? Is our world really tame and predictable and well-behaved? I'm suspecting a whole lot of you are nodding your heads. I certainly am. A better way to describe this world is what we call the dice world, which is messy and wicked. And dice, you know, when you throw dice onto a table, you never know exactly how they're going to come up. That's sort of a characteristic of this world. So the D in this world stands for dynamic, that the systems actually are complex behaviors. It's exponential growth and overshoot and collapse and oscillation and cycles. And none of these are nonlinear. That's the real world that we live in, at least as we perceive it today, it's impossible to completely understand. It's not even possible to fully understand complex problems. As soon as we begin to think we understand the social system, which is what we're talking about here, it changes. So the universe holds a lot of mystery, and, and as managers, we need to be humble in dealing with it. And let's not forget what happened to Dr. Frankenstein when he didn't proceed with humility. He, made his management decision and quickly lost control of it. So the world also is complex. That there are social problems that have a variety of different variables and relationships between those variables. If you just think even one relationship between two variables, say two spouses, can be very difficult to understand and work through. Now imagine a system that has dozens of variables interacting together. And once again, that's the world that we're dealing with. The E in DICE is ever-changing and evolving, that all of these many relationships and variables are changing at different speeds, changes everywhere in the short to medium term. And in the long term, the universe is becoming more complex, interconnected, self-organizing, and conscious. Many even argue it appears to have a direction. And that is the opposite of stability in the day in the plus world so this is a world where change comes very quickly and problems refuse to say solved even if you think you've solved the problem it may not stay that way very long in fact these wicked and messy problems are, are those for which there is no correct answer not even a single definition of a problem very different from those comments we just saw from the article in e360 yale Wicked problems are connected to other messy problems and for which we need new approaches to planning, or we ended up getting stuck in this dark swamp with our plans that do us no good. 
facts here in this dark swamp, solutions aren't right or wrong. They're more or less useful. So problems can be framed or defined in many different ways, as I mentioned. So tourism or over-tourism, for example, could be seen as a capacity problem. Okay, there's not enough rangers. There's a huge maintenance backlog. There's budget cuts. Or you could see it as a population problem, as some of the commenters mentioned in the article, that there's just too many people in the world and too many tourists. It could be seen as a cultural or a behavioral problem, that the Asians mass together on buses and flood parking lots. Or it could be seen as a recreation problem, that people love their parks to death. Whatever definition or frame that you choose, though, ends up giving you yielding very different strategies or solutions and different sets of actors. So the problem then with this dice world or the problem with dice world problems is that since there's no way to actually simulate a complex messy world and we can't put Zion National Park into a laboratory and see how the different interventions affect eco, uh, over tourism, we don't really know what the right answer is until the problem's actually solved. And once again, be aware that problems don't say stay solved forever. So I do need to make an important note that most sites in this in the world don't actually have an over tourism problem. This is a point that uh, a Taptus colleague Jim Barbarek pointed out and thanks for that point if you're in the audience Jim. But for those sites who do think they do have an over tourism problem, determining if they actually have over tourism is a moving target. All visitation, all visitors have impacts. That's just the basic principle of visitor management. So dealing with over tourism is not simply about eliminating impacts. You can never eliminate them all. But rather it has to do with weighing positive versus negative impacts and making tough choices, tough trade-offs. The challenge is that different people give different importance to the same impact. You know, what is tour over tourism then is inherently subjective and it's weighed heavy with values of different kinds of users and different kinds of stakeholders. So let's start off here. Uh, Steve wrote a series of uh, mini articles for the Tapas group that gave birth to this webinar, and he defined uh, over tourism in that as a preliminary first definition, de first draft definition, to be fair. And he wrote over tourism occurs when conditions on the ground, for example, visitor numbers, bison jams, that's when cars have a are blocked by bison on the road and they, they pile up. Uh, visitor behavior exceeds our limit of acceptable change or our ability to receive the experience we seek or management seeks to facilitate. It may also occur if conditions in communities fundamentally change its ability to function as a community as its residents desire. And it might occur when negative impacts occur that are not acceptable to the values being protected. So the key words I really want to pull out of this definition is acceptable change, that it's a very subjective matter to determine if over-tourism is occurring. So in this dice world that is changing very rapidly, and as a matter of fact, it's not just changing rapidly, the speed of change is accelerating in this world, whether it's technological or cultural or environmental. So that we see that over-tourism changes with who the stakeholder is. What's acceptable depends on different people's perspectives and their interests and their expectations. Over tourism, for one, is not for another. For example, tour operators, concessionaires, local businesses may have a higher level of tolerance for many impacts than, say, do tourists, heritage managers, community residents, or even trampled flowers. Over tourism changes also with the expectations about the desired experience. A high density is acceptable in some places, such as some beaches, theme parks, even famous parks, depending on what people expect they're going to receive as an experience. Uh, local communities and managers oftentimes have very different expectations of the visitor experience. Over tourism changes also depending on the season and the month. And the very days, here we're looking at a woman who's in the Monarch Butterfly Reserve in Mexico. And when the butterfly is there, it's a peak moment. And that only happens, hmm, I should have asked Alan first, but I imagine it's no, no more than a couple months. And the rest of the year, visitation drops off, both by the butterflies and by the tourists. 
Over tourism also changes in space as visitors are displaced from one place to another, between attractions within a park or between parks within a system. They may be displaced because, well, they don't like the congestion or the policies change. So this problem displacement tends to lead to planning and trying to solve the problem. Just like uh, Thomas More said, you're trying to solve a sore on your arm in one place and then it appears on the other place. And then you try to solve it on the other arm and it appears on your leg. So this is the displacement, non-system way of looking at it. Over-tourism can also change as management conditions change. If a manager decides to harden the site here, some of the impacts go away, like erosion, which may have been the objective, but other impacts emerge from that very change. For example, birds may move away from this, uh, from this higher traffic area, thanks to hardening the site. Over-tourism changes with visitors, too. As visitors change, their behaviors change with different kinds of impacts. Sites could suffer, called depreciative behavior. You can see the, the graffiti on this particular sign. If, for example, other spaces for teenagers are taken away, they may move to a different part of the park and do teenager things. Or birders might become very unhappy as the site becomes popular with other kinds of visitors. Because the impacts and the valuation of these impacts by the different users and different stakeholders is constantly changing, heritage managers also need a management style that's adaptive and continuous, so they can continually try to keep up with this rapid change. Obviously, having a visitor management plan that's updated every five or ten years uh, isn't going to work, nor is having a one-time magic carrying capacity number, which doesn't have the capacity itself to continuously update. So this new management style that I'm alluding to right now could navigate over tourism through the use of a tool such as a holistic map. So to understand complexity requires looking at different forces at work. What are the different forces that are feeding into the over tourism problem? You know, so to understand over tourism, we can use what's called an integral or a holistic map, which is an idea by American philosopher Ken Wilber. And this is the same map that Steve and I used to structure our book. I'll give you a view of that now. So Wilmer says there are four fundamental dimensions to view any complex situation. And if you look at any complex situation from only one or two of these dimensions, then you're blind to a whole set of forces that are at work and that can kind of make your problem much worse. So let's just quickly go through these four different dimensions. In the upper left corner, where it says interior individual, this is the realm of the psychology, or the inner experience. Every one of you out, all the 117 of you out in the listening audience are having an experience right now, hopefully positive, that only you know, only that you feel. I mean, I can ask you about your experience, and in fact, at the end of this webinar, there will be a, a survey. But it's an experience only you, only you know, and that includes your thoughts, your values, your mental well-being, perceptions, memories, states of mind, the interior of the individual. Looking in the upper um, right is the exterior of the individual. These are things that can be objectively measured from the outside. You can measure your physical well-being by looking at your heart rate or blood test. I can measure your behaviors, your skills, competencies by putting you to the test. Um, you know, I can measure what you do as a tourist going through a particular site. In the lower left, there's the cultural dimension. This is the creation of two or more minds coming together. Again, referring to those two spouses, they have a whole culture, a series of co-created understandings between the two of them that everybody else in the world, in the universe, can't know or understand. I suppose they could try to join that marriage, but that might not work. In any event, looking at larger groups of shared values, meanings, worldviews, relationships, a collective or group background would be what this dimension focuses on. And then we have the social environment and systems. This would be the physical exterior manifestation of the collective ideas. So these are the, the networks and the policies and the technologies and the tools and the forms of government and, and even the natural environment itself would fall into that. And all four of these different realms are interacting. 
So the interesting and problematic thing is that there are many disciplines, professional disciplines, that are biased to one or more quadrants. For example, in the upper left, psychologists spend most of their time. Trainers and marketers, they inhabit the upper right. Anthropologists and historians are in the lower left, while engineers, economists, tourists, and analysts, and planners oftentimes restrict themselves more to the lower right. In general, the development world, international development community, has largely maintained itself on what is measurable and physical, which is the right-hand column, oftentimes ignoring the interior aspects of each person and of each culture of each group in the left-hand column. This bias, leads, uh, this bias leads to people ignoring other quadrants, and they're oftentimes blind to the forces that come from there. I like to use the metaphor of a, a Navy destroyer, a, a warship that can only see torpedoes coming from one side and totally ignores the other side. So when the torpedo hits, they're taken by surprise, and that's the same as, say, seeing a USAID donated tractor rusting in an agricultural field conservationists who focus mostly on management wildlife rather than human wildlife and find their projects don't work, plans that end up on shelves, or tourism that gets out of control. These would all be examples of looking at complex problems, perhaps, but not looking at them from all four perspectives. So now I want to look at some of the causes of over-tourism in each of the quadrants. It's certainly, I don't mean to be exhaustive. In fact, I'm just so they fit into the boxes on the screen. But the point is, to illustrate the multiple dimensions at work and that they're always interacting. So now let's look at some of these examples. All right, so in the upper left we have what some people call psychographics, you know, the psychological aspects. So this could be the tourists or the managers. What are the values or beliefs that tourists have? What are the recreational demands? Are they looking to visit a particular kind of environment or a particular kind of activity or a certain kind of benefit? What is it that they're actually looking for? Uh, how much tolerance do they have to over-tourism, to congestion, and what is the desired visitor, visitor experience that they're looking for? So these are all aspects that we need to know to manage over-tourism, what's going on inside the tourist's mind. Okay, the exterior, the upper right, this you might call demographics. You know, these are the things that we can physically measure about the tourists or about the managers themselves. For example, here I see managers have techniques used to control visitor behavior. They have certain skills to measure visitors and impacts, and then the visitors themselves have behaviors that vary depending on the kind of group. So we need to know both about the managers and the visitors, and perhaps even other stakeholders, to get a more complete view of over-tourism. So down in the lower left, we have what we could call the ethnographics. Um, there's just a lot of different ideas that influence over tourism, the perception of a positive versus a negative impact, perception of what is attractive, what conservation paradigm is being used, what's the community's vision of its own development in terms of, say, property values, public services, community pride, relationship with other communities, with the private sector, with the managers. How do they define the problem? What is the relative importance of different goals, say, revenue generation versus political support versus conservation versus giving control to indigenous communities? And then in the last one, and I don't have a word that ends in graphics like the other three, so if somebody else has one, please send it to me afterwards, uh, is where we have visitation patterns, the monitoring system of visitors and these exterior systems, enforcement capacity, how local businesses influence visitation, the landscape design, uh, how that affects visitor flows, how marketing affects demand, infrastructural hardness, visitor distribution, experience opportunities that are available, policies and rules, which are oftentimes, as Steve says, are past solutions, which are now causing present problems. So anyway, all of these factors interact, and a simple solution like the ones that I read to you at the very beginning is to pick just one element from just one quadrant, say pricing or education, or improving a relationship, and thinking that you will solve the problem. Now, oftentimes you'll solve it locally, but it could come back later in someplace else. So a major factor for managers then is vision, which is a lower left, and a capacity or skill, upper right, to think in terms of these holistic terms in the first place. If managers can't do that, then they may be doomed to simplistic, tame solutions in a wild dice world. Holistic planning, as Steve and I define it in our book, 
requires a planning process that develops these skills among stakeholders to continuously experiment and update their tourism management plans in a manner appropriate for the DICE world. So now I would uh, like to hand over this presentation back to Alan and to my colleague, Steve McCool. Thank you very much. Uh, first, it's a real pleasure to be here and to participate in this webinar. And I wanted to thank uh, Chiago, uh, who first came up with the idea of the seminar, and then Alan, Luis, Anna, uh, Virginia, Nadi, for help helping get this getting this thing going. Um, <clears throat> As, as Anna mentioned, I am a, a, a retired university professor working on visitor use management problems, but spent most of my career doing that. And I, <clears throat> the reason for this seminar is that, um, and we, okay, we, we can, uh, <clears throat> is that uh, when this term over tourism came to me, which I really don't like when I first recognized it, and as, as, uh, as John mentioned, the, uh, I was struck by the number of very simplistic uh, uh, solutions that were being thrown around. And this was primarily within the context of uh, high levels of congestion visitation in cities. And some of these solutions were things like increase the aviation fuel tax in Europe, and that's going to solve the problem. Um, an another set was, was to make visitation much more expensive. And I know within a protected areas context, that's probably the last thing we want to do. We want people to visit protected areas. We want them to make their connections with their natural heritage. So I wrote a series of essays uh, on my blog, The Past Flower, and, and with Tapas, and then we decided to, to do a webinar, uh, which um, I'm happy to see that so many people are participating. Uh, in that, okay, you can go ahead, um, Alan, uh, with the next, with the next, um, uh, uh, or whoever it is, okay, screen, and there we go. <clears throat> and so I just uh, have these headlines here. This was just with reference to U.S. national parks, and of course, I'm sure that there are uh, references to uh, other national parks, and, and particularly if we were to go to TripAdvisor and look at comments on a park, uh, we might see uh, some of these kinds of things. So this has become a very important social problem uh, in, uh, around, around the world, really, as, as parks increase, uh, as visitation increases to, to national parks. And it's kind of interesting because a few years ago at the World Parks Congress, there was a lot of discussion about trying to get more people involved uh, and visiting national parks, and once that happened, now we're complaining about it. So, um, you know, it, it's a real dilemma in this, and, and John has explained and briefly described some of the dimensions of this problem. It's not something that there's a silver bullet for. We're going to have to work hard to uh, deal with this, and uh, several months ago, TAPA sponsored uh, webinars on at least one particular framework with which we can uh, work. So go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> See, can you go to the next slide? <laughs> Got it. Okay, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to refer to this particular park, Plitvitska Lakes National Park, uh, which is located uh, in in uh, uh, Croatia. I've worked there for several years with the park. It's in the process of developing uh, revision and a new management plan, general management plan, as well as a visitation, a visitor management plan. And Plavitska Lakes uh, is probably a prototype for uh, high levels of congestion that, we're, that we see referred to as uh, over tourism. Okay, uh, next slide, please. You'll be able to see uh, here that the, the visitation to Plavitska Lakes uh, has increased quite quite rapidly uh, since 2001. It's now almost three times the visitation level it was just 16 years ago. And, and 10, 10 to 15 years or so 
is kind of what the uh, what it takes 10 to 15 years is to develop a, a lot of new infrastructure to, to handle this level of visitation and, and the infrastructure in the park was designed back in the early 2000s and now it's got three times the amount of visitation and okay go go to the next slide please and this visitation uh, is highly um, um, highly uh, temporally significant, highly variable. So this, this graph shows uh, the distribution of, of uh, use by hour in the park, basically the entrances. There, there's two bars because uh, here, because there are two entrances. And you can see that um, you might, and this is for a date, uh, August 8th, uh, this past year, you can see that visitation entrances can reach, in, at least in one entrance, uh, 1,200 people in one particular hour during the, the late morning. So visitation in many of these places is highly uh, uh, distributed, uh, very variably distributed uh, uh, over over time, and that has a lot to do with the kind of solutions, resolutions to these problems. As, as John mentioned, the, this problem never stays solved. Never stays solved in uh, wicked and messy situations because the context is always uh, changing. But given this, you know, you can, if you go into the park uh, around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, you are, are not going to have a very good experience. I was just there um, uh, last week and there were about 8,000 people entered the park that day and that's probably uh, um, around the maximum number of, of people that you would want to have in the park. That's not a carrying capacity. It's a use limit, uh, but that's not what's going to happen in the, in the uh, management plan, but that's my personal preferences. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> what John has talked about is kind of framing the problem. That's about the past. And uh, we need a really good understanding of the dimensions of this problem, but we need some kind of process for dealing with it. And so what I'm going to show you now are three simple questions. This is not really a process, but it's kind of the progression of how we need to approach uh, dealing with such problems. So the, uh, hit the forward button, please. So <clears throat> we need to start asking why. Uh, as our as our first as our first question that we ask, um, uh, uh, and this is one thing that I saw missing and and read and in a lot of the presentations and discussions about over tourism, uh, no one ever asked the question why. We always start with the question how or what. Why don't you show the the next? There we go. Show the why. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, why uh, are we doing something? Why do why do we have visitation? Why do we have tourism? What is our vision of a particular park? We have to start there. Unfortunately, most people now are starting with how and what. That's the so uh, what what they're doing is talking about um, you know raising gasoline or fuel uh, fuel taxes. They're talking about um, making a visit much more expensive, they're talking about changing marketing, but no one is really talking about the nature of the problem and then looking toward the future. What is it that we're, what is it that we want this part for? So I'm gonna briefly address each of these three questions. So next slide, please. So the first question is why? And, and this question basically is one of what is the what is the vision of public use? And the question, the more important questions here about this is, what do people take away from a visit? Now, how many park plans have a vision that talks about what is it that people are going to take away from a visit? What is their vision? How how are visitors changed and transformed when they when they have a visit to a park? Uh, what happens to the community? So. Um, uh, that's that may be located near, nearby um, and in, in terms of Plitvitska Lakes 
when I first uh, visited there, the, I was asked, "Well, is our is our manage is our management of, of visitors successful?" And I looked at what they had in their management plan, and my response response was, "Well, I don't know." And the reason I said I don't know is because there was no real objectives established for man managing visitors. They were they, well, there were objectives, but they were so broad, such as allowing sustainable recreation. Uh, which uh, it doesn't really communicate very well what it is what it is that we're we're really achieving. So what's the vision of public use? Um, this is kind of a, a, a statement that uh, describes the future that, that's aspirational. What is it that we want? Do what do people want? Uh, what do people? What do visitors? Excuse me. Come away with when they have visited this particular park? Is it a better understanding? of the tufa formations that cause the waterfalls uh, in, in there, and the natural processes. Is it some sense of adventure, some sense of connection with nature? And, and so the, the statement of vision is aspirational, but it's going to drive our, the actions that we employ to manage visitors in there. And it would reflect uh, the shared values and beliefs, the things that John was talking about down in the, in the lower left. And so my, my advice here is that we always begin with asking why, and in this case, what is the vision of public use here? And that's something I think uh, all of us need to do. If we're going for the first thing we need to do is if we want to re seriously resolve this. Now, I, I'll have to say that writing a vision statement, uh, particularly a succinct vision statement, is very difficult and time consuming. I, uh, about a month ago, I was just at Iguazu National Park in Brazil, and we, we had a public meeting there, and we were we tried to write uh, a, a vision statement, and we were not particularly successful in that. I didn't expect we would be, but the point was that people began to understand as they participated in this, and the people were both managers and members of the public, the various constituencies, they began to understand that this is very difficult, and it is very difficult. Again, there are no silver bullets. If we apply silver bullets and simplistic answers, we are going to come up with um, solutions that aren't particularly appropriate. Okay, next slide, please. So the question of how, how we're going to uh, implement this vision. So we need to describe our desired experiences and settings. Uh, what and address the question of what are the outcomes for visitors? Is it challenge, adventure, learning about nature, natural processes? Is it uh, visitor cohesiveness? Uh, excuse me, family cohesiveness? Uh, is it escape, solitude? Is it, is it something else? We need to describe the outcomes of communities. And in particular, we need, again, up in the why question, to talk about a little bit about why, uh, what, what it is that tourism should sustain. We, how also we zone the unit for experiences. So in the case of Plipitska Lakes, uh, they have five different zones based on visitor experiences. There's other zoning that went on for biodiversity protection, but they zone for visitor experiences. And so we also have to identify indicators and standards. The principles that are operating here is that diversity in recreation or visitor opportunity is key to quality. Uh, we think about this question that John mentioned is how much change is acceptable, how much change in the natural environment is acceptable, how much change in the social setting is acceptable. And we need to understand that many variables, and again John alluded to this, affect the relationship between use levels and impact, biophysical and social. And just, uh, you know, just drawing a line about how many people may visit a particular unit without really understanding these relationships, again, leads to simplistic answers and then to uh, probably uh, major uh, issues, uh, problems, and probably uh, in inadvertently unacceptable levels of impact someplace else. And so, um, this little saying at the back, at the bottom, it's not mine, uh, but to every complex problem there is a simple answer, and it is wrong. Okay, so that's what we have to remember. Okay, the next slide, please. So 
So then we think about the what, and the what is developing a pathway. And that pathway for us as, as academics and managers is using a framework of some kind that will enhance and, uh, and uh, uh, structure our critical thinking, okay? Use a framework, and uh, several months ago, uh, Tampas did ha have a discussion on a visitor use management framework that all of the federal agencies in the United States uh, have agreed to use. And that's what we need. We need some kind of framework to structure our thinking. And of course, we have to engage the public. And the basic reason for that uh, is to create ownership and build trust uh, among our constituencies. Then trust is something that's very difficult to build uh, and is quick to lose. And it's going to take some time to do that. And then we need to develop a consensus, and a consensus helps us organize uh, resources for action. And uh, um, in that framework, we should probably be doing some research on our visitors, because if we don't understand our visitors, we're not going to, uh, we don't know really how to manage them. Okay, so next slide. So the question is now, what does all this translate to into specific kinds of actions? So, um, whoops. Uh, so uh, we need to go to the next slide. Okay, so um, we just need to hit the down arrow to go. One, one way to do this is to increase the supply of our <clears throat> of our opportunities. And at Plavitska Lakes, uh, uh, in the, their zoning will reflect an increase in the number of trails available for people to enjoy different parts of the park. Um, we can harden sites. Uh, I think John mentioned that, uh, and you know that's putting concrete down or a wooden bar, uh, wooden uh, boardwalk. Plavitska Lakes, virtually all the trails near these near these lakes in there are on a boardwalk, so they're pretty well hardened. We need to educate visitors. This is um, something we always need to do about the kind of impacts and the behavior that may be. Um, uh, causing some conflicts at Plavitska Lakes. Uh, selfies are, are, are a big issue because the boardwalks are very narrow and a selfie takes the whole boardwalk, the width of the boardwalk. And when you have eight or 9,000 people visiting the, the park in a day, you get a lot of congestion just from people taking uh, selfies. The marketing, uh, you know, what's, what's our market here? And, and basically, who are the visitors that we want to attract? And in Plavitska Lakes, they want to change the marketing to get people who are more interested in a broader range of visitor experiences and who will stay longer. About 400,000 of the 1.7 million visitors currently, uh, their average length of stay is three hours. They're barely there. They barely touch the park. But you have to change the character of the, of the visitors that you have there to, to have them experience this. We need to think more regionally and uh, about all the attractions and destinations that are outside of the park that can uh, redistribute uh, people to not only visit the park, but have them stay in the region longer. And uh, like the three hour, uh, three hour visit, people basically leave no uh, economic impact at all to the local community. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to think regionally about the kinds of themes and opportunities that are available to redistribute use. Um, we, and we need to, uh, another technique is redistributing use temporally. So you saw the big, the big increase in use in the middle of the day um, by using pricing or some other kind of mechanism. Uh, we can maybe redistribute the use off the peaks and into the, into the shoulder parts of the day or into shoulder parts of the week or into the shoulder parks of the yearly season. So in late October in Plavitska Lakes, the use level drops. And so we could, uh, uh, one, one action is to get people to come a little bit later in the year. And then finally, as one alternative, as probably a last alternative, we can limit use to, uh, um, uh, and that's not a carrying capacity. Uh, it's a use limit policy that reflects the how, the why, what kind of experience that we are we trying to, to employ. So um, next slide, please. 
So uh, in conclusion then, uh, the first thing we need to do, and John, this is what John's presentation was all about, is framing the problem and understanding the context. That is something that's so important and that is something that's missing in the general discussion about over-tourism. Very few people, other than saying there's congestion, have framed this problem in terms of the notions that, that, Jim have, uh, that, that Ron has talked about. We need to think and act holistically. John, John mentioned that about all these quadrants. All these quadrants that he mentioned are operative in any given situation. We need to dive deeper to describe the why. When looking to the future, how we're going to manage a place in the future, we need to figure out why, the, the why, the vision, and the rationale for this. We need to use a framework such as limits of acceptable change or recreation opportunity spectrum that are two frameworks that are very widely used. To, that Those frameworks help structure our thinking. And then we need to build ownership and trust. And, and those are critical to any kind of acceptability uh, for a management plan among the public, particularly the constituencies that, that, are, that are living uh, next to the park and, and some of the constituencies that are visiting the park. So uh, next slide. I just wanted to say thank you for participating. Uh, we have uh, over a hundred people here. What, the, what this says to me is that we need more of these webinars because these are serious problems uh, that we have to address and we have to tackle because these parks and reserves and refuges are very special places and um, I'd have to leave you with a message that every child that's going to live in the future should have the right to visit these places just to, as they are now, as they are better managed from now, as uh, then, um, then, then they should have the right uh, to visit those these places. So thank you again and I'll turn it back to Alan or Anna. Well, thank you very much, Stephen, for your presentation as well to, to John. Uh, we're going to put the last slide, which is um, of, the, of the webinar. So we've got that for the question and answer session. That uh, Unfortunately, we're going to do it a bit short, but we, there are several questions uh, for Stephen and John. I'll just share them, and then we can tackle them. Uh, I propose that we'll, John, Steve, just make sure that your microphones are on and maybe we can also turn on the video so people can see you while you answer these questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Regarding one of the last points that you made, Stephen, um, there's the question of how can we integrate local communities to support and participate in conservation goals in natural areas? So I'll send it to Stephen and John can complement. That is this part of ownership and on building trust uh, regarding local communities around national parks, protected areas, or in some countries like in Mexico within the, the protected areas. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's going to take um, a while to build from a sense of ownership. So um, we have to have uh, you know, our constituents, and it's not just local communities, because some communities that are located spatially far from a park may also benefit from that park because of visitor travel patterns. But we have to have them involved early in any kind and continuously in in our in our planning and management process. So, for example, uh, when, a month ago when I was at Iguazu uh, National Park, uh, they started their uh, public use planning process by by having a seminar on on public use and and some of the complexities. I was there and some other people, a couple of people that. Or part are part of campus actually help give presentations um, <clears throat> about 
developing a vision for the park and some other things. And then the next two days, we're working with, with, with people in communities that were located nearby. And we spent a whole day uh, talking about, uh, well, we, we didn't talk. We let the community talk. The community talked about what it was that they felt they needed. And Iguazu has kind of a controversial uh, history. It's, it's a World Heritage Site, just like the Blitzko Lakes. Uh, but uh, they, we asked them for their contributions, for their ideas about how the park could be managed to better achieve its goals, but also to provide more opportunities for visitors. At Iguazu, uh, the, the visitation pattern is very similar to Plavitska Lakes, the, the trend over the last 15 years. The visitation levels are almost exactly the same. Uh, however, a large part of the park in, has been closed to any kind of visitor use, and yet there's some spectacular places there. And so the community was asked how, how could they, you know, what kinds of things could they do uh, within the constraints of uh, the, the outstanding universal values of, of Iguazu, what kinds of modest tourism development could, would they propose? And so for that was the first time the communities have been actually asked uh, to propose things rather than just react to, to a management plan. That was the first step in developing trust. So engagement early and continuously uh, throughout the planning process, and I'll, and I'll turn it over to John now. Um, to build on what Steve suggested, I think there's a wide variety of different techniques that could be used. Anything from as modest as an, an extension education interpretation program in a community to something as complete as turning over the entire management of protected area to communities, such as an indigenous reserve. Now, most of us fall somewhere in between, but we don't know where we fall in between most of the time. So the question is, how do we find out what suite of uh, engagement techniques we want to use, community engagement? So one way to do that is to actually have a multi-stakeholder joint fact-finding or a participatory situation analysis, where the park and several other stakeholders and communities form a committee and they actually go out into the community to try and understand these relationships between the park and uh, the community and the different stakeholders. And in this joint fact-finding, not only are they coming up with answers to that question, but they're coming up with a legitimate sense of a legitimate set of data. Because oftentimes, as you know, in many protected areas, there's a great lack of trust, as Steve had mentioned. So if the park says, oh, well, the community needs an environmental education program, they need to create up an advisory board to advise us, the community's like, what the heck are you talking about? That's not what we need at all. And uh, even if it is what they need, because the park said it, they might not be regarded as a legitimate conclusion because the park created that information themselves. So yeah, I'll leave, leave that there to compliment Steve. Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing on that. Uh, that uh, we need to th we need to think about what it is that we're trying to achieve when, when we engage uh, the public. Uh, we need some kind of vision of that. Uh, we need some kind of objectives. Are are we doing this to create a sense of ownership? Are we doing this because we need we, we need the fact finding that, that John has mentioned? You know what what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And often in the past. We've just done public engagement because it was a good thing to do, and we didn't really have um, a, a good strategy about what it what it is that we are trying to accomplish. Um, and I, I like I'd like to say that that uh, uh, that when we think about public engagement, we we shouldn't think of it as a process separate from planning. And I think that's what John was was getting at there in this joint fact finding that it's in, well integrated, the public engagement is well integrated into and, and running uh, uh, along with any kind of technical planning processes. And I often like it, I liken the ideal public engagement process to like a DNA molecule. We've all seen the double strands of a DNA molecule with connections between. One strand is the technical process and the other strand is um, is the public engagement, 
and they join together like this, they become uh, not just parts, but become they become a larger whole. Okay, Alan? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you to Elizabeth Segovia who made that question. And I've got a second one. Um, this is from Ron Mader. You tell me who takes it first. It's why is our communication about park overcrowding so poor to visitors? Uh, we don't seem to know about over tourism until the situation is very poor, asks uh, Ron. Well, so the okay. question is why do parks wait till it's already occurring rather than being preventative? Is that? Yes, and, and, uh, and the question of communication as, as a key point to maybe prevent the situation of overcrowding or at least knowing as a visitor that when I come to the protected area, what can I expect? Well, I think certainly in a lot of, in most sites, in taking a systems perspective, there are strong forces in favor of increasing visitation in those sites where that actually occurs. As I mentioned, many sites are dying to have more visitation. But there are a lot of strong economic forces. There are mission forces, like Steve said, that we want to get as many people to experience these parks as possible. So while we're busy maximizing those values, what often happens is there's a delay in the system, a feedback delay, which is a communication delay. That, and I think this is something we all see naturally every day is we are, we're more reactive than proactive. We wait until there's actually damage, which then generates enough political will to take remediatory actions, as opposed to developing this dialogue, this more holistic view before it becomes a problem, anticipating it and then managing accordingly. But that, of course, requires, a, I think, a sort of a special culture that can, can look into the future and, and map where the site's going and to generate enough political will resources to take preventive actions. It's so much easier and natural to wait until the damage is already being done. I, I, I would you know, agree with that, but also, you know, uh, traditionally con uh, in conventional planning for a park and protected areas built on this plus paradigm that that uh, that John talked about earlier and things like uh, visitor use are often all but ignored in it I've seen many many general management plans where uh, the plan may be 250 pages long filled with biodiversity data there's nothing wrong with the biodiversity data uh, but out of the 250 pages, there might be three or four pages devoted to uh, visitor use. So uh, this is this is what uh, I, what really bothers me, uh, and that this paradigm of uh, not defining the problem. I call I call it kind of like a paradigm pathology that uh, you know we it's spreading. Uh, uh, you know, the simplistic answers. And one of the issues is that we don't, most parks do not have a vision for what public use or visitor use is to look like. What is it that they want visitors to come away with? And, and in my view, particularly with World Heritage Sites, and, and this is very normative, so, um, you know, they, it's not that typical academia, but it's very normative what I'm going to say next is that I think uh, we should be in the business of transforming people's lives. Um, and uh, so that when people leave a park, they have an experience that they will, that, that they, they and their family or their friends will remember for a very long time and, and it will affect them to the point where when they get home, they might encounter a situation where there's some empty land that's not being used and they might start working to protect that particular land. That's, that's converting, transforming people into basically citizen naturalists that, um, that are become active in protecting our environment. Uh, protected areas are the cornerstone of conservation, but to be the cornerstone of conservation and to have an influence, it's not just the area the biodiversity, natural heritage within an area. It's the people that, that connect with that biodiversity and then take those connections home to do some other good uh, someplace else. So again, that's, that's a very normative kind of vision. 
and we don't have that in our parks okay we don't have that in our parks at all in our park planning so this is this pathology of continuing on with a conventional kind of planning approach uh, think not thinking holistically as John was was arguing and not thinking about what is what this vision of a park may be and if we have that vision there may be more political will and particularly if it's joint uh, developed by the parks constituencies uh, then we that that's the basis for developing the political will to resist uh, not managing this visitation at all which which is happening right now Thank you very much, Stephen and, and, and John. Uh, I'm going to throw you another, a last question. I just wanted to say to everybody that's listening to us that there's a lot of questions. All of the questions are being registered, and we're going to share them with John and Stephen, and maybe we can do a follow-up one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. As well, one of the main questions is uh, if the webinar is going to be available online, and it is, we're going to send you a link to the to the YouTube channel where we're going to put this uh, this recording. Uh, I'm going to take the question of Luis Arroyo. He says, in the case of Galapagos, policies, programs have been implemented to raise awareness among visitors and to focus on the type of tourism. Despite this, the visitation to the protected area is increasing. What should be done in that case? Increase the restrictions for entry to the protected area? Go to that limit of use, last resource suggestion that you made, Stephen? I'll pass it to Stephen and then back to John to end up the questions and answers. Well, I, I really can't say anything about the Galapagos because I, I don't know too much. I have never been there. And I've interacted in the past with a few uh, managers. Um, you know, education and marketing don't uh, necessarily result in reduced use. Okay, so um, uh, if if the use keeps increasing, again, you know, there's these larger forces that John mentioned. You know, we we need, uh, you know, you know, we a country may say, we, you know, we can get foreign exchange very easily, cost effectively, by increasing visitation, and and so we have these larger scale political forces. Mm -hmm. Bay. Now, if the use is increasing, the, the question I have is: Do do we are the conditions on the site not acceptable in terms of the kind of experience or the or the environmental impact? So, like this photo that's on that's on the screen right now uh, of all these cars. That was I took that picture in Yellowstone last July. Um, you know, and and basically the, those cars are waiting to get into one particular. Uh, small trail, a hot spring, to, to, to see the hot spring. So is that condition acceptable? If I have to wait an hour uh, on, sitting on the road to get in there, is that condition acceptable? And if, and if you tried everything else, then it's probably time to, to limit use. I'm not opposed to limiting use. Uh, uh, maybe it's a last resort. But the idea is that you thought about what your vision is. And uh, if if you uh, and we don't have time, I have a whole lecture that deals with this. But if 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 it isn't working, what you have now, then maybe it is time to limit use. And the question is, how are you going to limit it? What and and issues of efficiency and equity uh, then begin to arise. Okay, John. Yeah, it would probably be contradictory to everything we just said in this presentation to actually try to offer a suggestion. Um, because it would necessarily be simplistic and non-participatory. And even though, unlike Steve, I had my honeymoon in Galapagos, I cannot profess to be uh, having thought deeply about the particular issues since I don't work there. Um, I would like to put a name to what Steve just did, because so often people, and I'm, I'm, I think in Luis Arroyo's case as well, we often think about the entire park. Should we reduce visitation? And should we put limit use at the entrance? But as Steve alluded, the question oftentimes shouldn't be asked at the park level. It should be asked at particular attractions, particular sites. And then you ask, well, you know, Galapagos, for example, there's over a dozen different islands. Some of them probably have sub-visitation and others of them have over-visitation. So what can we do within the park? 
how can we harden one particular trail and make reduce a big impact? So a lot of times, the decision we want to ask is that a attraction by attraction or a destination, a site by site, rather than the entire park, which is much easier. But again, is over generalizing to ask if we should limit visitation to the whole park. It might be the right scale in the case of Galapagos. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a good notion, John. Um, you know, again. A uh, use is highly variable spatially and, and temporally. So, in some cases, it just might be that you limit use in a, in a particular place. At Plavitska Lakes, uh, I think it's about, I think Plavitska Lakes is 20,000 or 60,000 hectares. I can't remember the exact size, but all the use occurs on about 1,000 hectares. So, that's where you would want to limit it. Maybe you don't limit it. In, in some place, in, uh, in other places. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm opening the microphone to Anna Spensley as well to see if we start having closing remarks and thank, uh, thanking everybody for the possibility of uh, creating or organizing this webinar for the participation of Stephen and John. Thank you very much for your support for the to the Tapas Group initiative of webinars, as well as to the Sustainable Tourism Program, and to the Poop Consortium of Global Heritage. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pass it to you if you want to say some final remarks, Stephen and John. Well, again, I want to say thank you to all the participants that showed up. And, and to all the people and organizations that uh, helped uh, organize uh, this webinar. Uh, and then, you know, more substantively, to recognize that simplistic answers just aren't going to, aren't going to work. And, you know, we always have this drive for simplicity, but unless we understand the complexity behind it, uh, the simple answers are probably not going to, going to work. Um, there is a lot to this issue of over-tourism or congestion, and we just touched on, on the surface uh, of this. And so I'm hoping uh, and suggesting uh, maybe we can do more webinars when, once we see what these questions are. Maybe we can form some, some webinars around specific questions and issues that people have raised. So again, thank you very much for participating. Okay, John. The world is changing really fast, and it's the change is actually accelerating. And to semi quote uh, my colleague here, Steve, decades ago, managers, governments used to be able to unilaterally implement their plans. Today, they while they still retain the power to create their plans, they no longer can implement them. Problems are much more complex. There are many more voices in the democratic arena demanding different values of the sites. There's fewer resources and time to, to do the, to execute their plans. So necessarily parks, all kinds of heritage areas need to involve their community stakeholders, not because it's the correct thing to do, but it's because it's necessary. They need resources from those communities, whether it be political support, um, man and woman power, financial donations, in order to get these plans implemented, including how to deal with over-tourism. Communities, of course, won't commit to ma making these contributions if they don't see their ideas and their efforts reflected in the processes and in the plans that come out. So in order for that to happen, then parks need to share more of the decision-making power. Traditionally, it's been plans are technical documents and only technically qualified folks can actually make the decisions. And even once some of that power is shared, communities oftentimes need additional skill sets to participate actively, constructively in that planning process, whether it be conflict management or dialogue or building trust. So essentially a tourism planning process does two things. It creates a technical plan, and it also empowers the community to implement that plan. And again, maybe this is another DNA with two strands wrapped around, but I think that's more of a, a holistic view. It's not just about making plans that end up on the shelves uh, covered in dust like a trophy. 
that certainly won't solve over tourism. So ultimately, we want to find new ways to engage community and share power rather than centralize it. Back to you, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, well, we'll end up this uh, really interesting Tapas webinar. and We'll see you in the next one. Thank you for participating from different parts of the world. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, John. Bye-bye, Alan. Thanks. And to tapas. <laughs>